Um, we are going to get started because we only have an hour. I want to make sure we have an opportunity to answer all of your questions. Uh, my name is Michelle Fecto. I am the executive director of the, of the union. Um, and we're putting on this workshop in order to cover some general issues that we think um, are important that you should know about that, are, um, that seem to be timely. Uh, and they're focusing in three areas. One is on um, your rights to challenge uh, policy or contractual violations in, in the contract. Uh, the other is, um, is on bylaws and factors, the development and the importance of those. And the third is some of the committees that we have within our contract that uh, support and even require uh, shared governance. So we're going to go over that. We'll try to do that within a half hour or less. And, um, and then uh, we will open it up for questions. And it'll just be whatever questions you want. So it's a really informal format. Um, and I wanted to thank uh, Ricardo Villarosa. Ricardo Villarosa is the union's contract and, uh, grievance coordinator for the academic staff. So. You know, our uh, counselors, librarians, uh, advisors, uh, coord uh, extension coordinators, people like that. Um, uh, Rita Casey uh, is our grievance coordinator for faculty. And uh, she's also um, a associate professor in psychology. And Ricardo um, is in the dean of students office and uh, works there. Is uh, very knowledgeable. He's also um, uh, an attorney. so. Okay. Um, so with that, um, ready to get started? Sure. sure. Hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> You're all very far away. That's all right. um, we talked a little bit about this. This is going to be very important. You got there's a bunch of materials in the back, um, and we'll as we go through, we may refer to some of them. The thing that Rita and I and the contract enforcement team would like you to know that you may not be aware of is that we have grievance coordinators and contract implementation officers on both the faculty and the academic staff side, and we have Michelle as the executive director and Charlie as the president, who if you have been involved or know people who have been involved with issues, grievances, challenges, we tend to work as a team. What happens when people see our titles, grievance coordinator? Two different things happen very often. Either somebody says, oh, no, I don't want to talk to you yet because they're, they've got a, they have a problem, but they don't want to go all the way to the grievance process and, and think that we shouldn't be talking to us, or they want to talk to us because they're not happy and that's got to be a grievance. So uh, those are two ends of a spectrum that if we do anything to let you know about what your rights are and how we work for you, is that there's a there's a team, a contract enforcement team that gets together, we work together. So you can see any of us if you have questions or issues along the way. And if it's not something that we're handling directly, we can get you to the right place. You also have your council reps, both on the faculty and academic staff side. And that's an initial place to, to have some of these conversations too and find a way to get to us. Um, and with that broad overview, we'll turn it back over to Rita. Um, I just also like to add a couple of things to that, that very often people have problems and there's a difficulty and only a piece of that is something that can be formally grieved through the grievance process. That doesn't mean we won't listen to you and won't try to help you with other things. I mean, that's one of the things we want to do is to help the university run better and have things work better for you. That's one reason why we have those contract implementation officers who often are willing to go with you as we are to go talk to administrators to try to work things out without getting to the point of filing a formal grievance. But I would say it's really hard. Uh, there are people who are really afraid to come to the union. They're afraid to come to Maccabees. They're afraid to come to the third floor. They're afraid to call the union. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I received a phone call from an unnamed faculty member who was speaking on behalf of another unnamed faculty member. And I did meet with the person, but it was kind of like, well, you drunk, we're going to such and such a restaurant, and I'll be at the third table dressed in green. You know? <laughs> 
because they really were so afraid. And that tells you something about how toxic the work is where they are, that you know, they're so scared that even coming to ask for help scares them. So that happens. Sometimes things prevent you from getting help that you really could get help because you don't know about it. You don't understand that help is available. Um, or that you think you will be deliberately uh, punished in some way if you involve the union. And that does happen sometimes, but that is also something that is explicitly forbidden. And we try to make sure that doesn't happen to people and protect them. You can also get wrong advice. Um, when I was, was here as a brand new faculty member, I was told, absolutely don't join the union. If you join the union, you know, you'll never get tenure. You know, and I'd never been to a unionized university before. This is the first place I've ever been that had a union. And so it was like, gosh, the person who told me this is a union activist. This is really, really scary. Um, things have changed a lot at Wayne State since David Adam. Manny is no longer president, but this was his shadow hanging over. Um, so it's hard to feel safe sometimes if you're in trouble specifically and it's not a problem that other people seem to have. Um, you may also not have a council rep in your unit, somebody who is active in the union that you can talk to. So you may be depending on hearsay and just not be sure of whether something is grievable or not. But I'm saying we are also here to help you with problems that aren't necessarily problems. I had a brand new faculty member in my own unit who got here and found out she was pregnant. She's from a foreign country that is much more generous with family leave than we are. And so she was really afraid to bring this up with, with the department chair. And I know our department chair, and I happen to know he wouldn't mind at all uh, having a new faculty member who was expecting a baby. But other department chairs are not necessarily uniformly thrilled about having a female faculty member have a baby. I've seen that happen a few times. Or, um, so it was important for her to come and just get some basic things. The contract, the green contract, which I hope all of you have a copy of, anyway, it's great, but it's largely written by lawyers. And I'm sorry, sitting by a lawyer okay, to no say point. this, Good but have <laughs> yeah. uh, parts of it are hard to read. Parts of it are hard to understand, and interpretation of it is not easy and not simple. So um, what I can say is we can't help people with problems without knowing what the problems are, without knowing who has the problem, without knowing where the problem is. I have literally been asked, can't you do something to get rid of this department chair without any of us coming forward and saying why he needs to be <laughs> booted out of his position? It's sort of like there's nothing in here about anonymously booting uh, administrators at all. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. A couple of things, and I, I think this gives a good overview. I also wanted to, you know, in speaking about how to challenge policies or decisions by the administrator. So one way is coming to the union, going to the um, contract enforcement team. But um, another way is um, organizing within your own department. There's mm -hmm. some issues that you can do that. And, and again, you know, when we talk about these committees or opportunities for shared governance, you can challenge, you can push back um, on some things. Um, so uh, looking for opportunities to talk to coworkers, the, the work oftentimes, whether you're academic staff or faculty, can be pretty isolating. You work on your own research, you're kind of in your own world, but sometimes reaching out to others and you'll realize that maybe they may be having the same problems, and if you go as a group, it's, you're much more protected just by being in a group than going as a single person. So that's one thing. And we've also helped promote that within the union. There was a couple of times um, in the College of Ed, there was a dean at one point, um, and we, the union, um, met with some faculty who were very dissatisfied, and we organized a vote of no confidence. So in the academia world, you know, when you are, you have overwhelming vote of no confidence, mm -hmm. it can be very damning. So this is a good check. And so even though it was over in the College of Ed, I believe the other deans know about this. And uh, we've done it before and for department chairs and another dean. But so the union helps uh, the group come up with the, you know, sometimes we do a survey, but this was just an up-down 
confidence. It was overwhelming. It was like 95% no confidence. And that Dean was asked to step down. And so that's an opportunity where the union worked together with groups of faculty who actually collaborated. So it wasn't just one person. So there's other, there's other ways of using our union strength. Um, but certainly a good step to come to know what your rights are is to have conversations with folks and we can let you know how we can support you, whether it's through agreements or through helping to organize or doing certain things like that. So. Rather than going all the way through and then doing Q&A, since we've got kind of three segments, do one and start and yeah. open it up. Okay. Yeah. That's a great idea. Yeah. We're going to take a, we've got three three areas that we want to talk about, as we said at the beginning, but rather than have you wait until the end, if there's a question that, from what we've been saying, something that comes up now, you can you can ask it later, but we want to open it up and see if there's any questions now about just the, the grievance process or how do you deal with the issues complaint. or whatever, yeah. Is there anything now? So uh, I have a question that I guess I guess the old grievance, but actually might not. And that's the um, relationship between the grievance process and going to HR and the ombuds person. Real good question. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the other question, um, I guess it might not be covered. This of uh, is there uh, anti-bullying? Uh, that is, if someone is bullying you in your bargaining unit. Mm -hmm. Can the union do anything? Or I guess another way to look at it is what's it called non flat non based harassment. That is so harassment of someone not based on gender, race, etc. Mm -hmm. So And are you talking in that last one that can happen in two different directions? From a coworker, somebody else who's a member of the union and or somebody who's in a supervisory role. Can you talk about both? Yeah, we can, but I was just curious if we... Yeah, I'd be interested in hearing about Hello. Um, so the, the first, let's see, yeah, that's, that's several questions. Let me see if we can get to the, the, the first one where you talk about, um, and I'm not sure if I'm going to capture how you wanted to break, get into this, but the relationship between HR and the union um, and where issues go. HR is an arm of the administration that often is looked to be, presents themselves as your friend and management's friend. The, our members, for most HR issues, the top officer for those, for those contractual things that HR normally deals with for other areas, for non-reps and for other, other representative individuals, is John Vanderwick. So many times issues that HR would, with, with, in other areas in your unit, are dealing with the same types of issues with your supervisors, the administrators, whether it's chairs, dean, chairs, directors. HR works with them and often will try to give them information about our contract. And in limited ways, they can do that. But anything that goes to interpretation, policy enforcement, individual enforcement, is supposed to be done through John Vanderwood's office. Um, they, they do, it does happen with HR um, from time to time. Um, but the, very often HR, and recently we've seen, since the new reorg that happened a couple years ago, HR has some new leadership and very often they get it wrong. So if there are things that are changing in your area with your faculty or staff that seem to be something that sounds like an HR driven policy, Bring it to our attention because we often find that in pockets things are changing. A dean or a chair or a director got some advice on how to change some things to be more efficient and effective in whatever business framing they wanted to use, and it's not quite appropriate for us. We deal with those I, give, I give you one example. Uh, HR came up with an instrument that got passed out in a unit, and used, people had to rate themselves, and then the ratings were been used to evaluate the people in that unit. And I heard about it, others heard about it, and the instrument, in fact, this is where tapping the scientific knowledge of the faculty was really good. Uh, the instrument was totally bogus without any validity whatsoever, and it has sort of one model of personality that everybody's supposed to have who works in a work site, and it's sort of like, are we individuals? Or are we supposed to be clones of each other here? Well, they're not using that instrument anymore. It wasn't. It's not strictly a grievance sort of thing, but working with HR and working with John Vanderweg, it was sort of like, 
we're a university. Do we want to use something that, that our experts would say is wrong? You know, so it's, it's not a, in the grievance, but the union definitely had a role in getting this particular thing stopped. Is there any time when you should go to HR and ask the union? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> we, made, again, we, made, we made direction to some some part of, but yeah, no. Um, there's HR. There's now. There's also total compensation and wellness, which is part of over HR. in there. And so there's times where we'll send you and work with that. But if there's a, yeah, you should. It's always as a general statement, as much as that can be. We always need to stop and check with us first. The main thing and, is we need to we need to have information about things that are going on that are new, different, weird, strange, or whatever, or wonderful, so we know what's happening in case there is something done that really clearly is a violation, or that we can keep it from becoming a violation by stopping it in, in midstream. Also, there's, I mean, I'm not quite sure where you're coming with your question, but I'm not aware of any anti-bullying policy. There is an anti-violence policy, which is quite broad and has been used in strange ways at times. Um, when somebody raises their voice, they're told they're bullying, you know. Um, so I would say that the new um, a thing over in the medical That's school what I was refers say. to. So, so there is this, you know, yeah. we have civility policies. So anytime the employer or any employer, when the administration wants to, wants to impose a new rule or regulation, um, like in the medical school, I think it's called professional conduct policy. Mm -hmm. It's very broad. They're required by law because we have a, a union and we're recognized. The majority of people voted for it. Um, we recognize union. They have to negotiate wages, hours, and working conditions. They cannot unilaterally impose a policy that affects wages, hours, and working conditions. So, for instance, I remember when I first got here to the union, um, they wanted to just do away with cash and lieu for health for benefits. And I was like, well, you can't do it mid-contract. You have to negotiate that. You have to negotiate with the union. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking to the head of HR, and he's like, well, I don't, I don't know about that kind of stuff. But I said, well, then you shouldn't do it if you don't know about that kind of stuff. So they had to retract it and give people back their cash and lieu. Because the law says, when, and that's considered an unfair labor practice, that if now there might be times that they make rules we don't know about it, so bring it to our attention. Because mm -hmm. I didn't know about that thing in uh, School of Medicine. Um, and there might be times where they pass rules and it's pretty innocuous. It's no big deal. It's not, you know, we don't yeah. we don't think it's any it's, it's objectionable. But um, but what we've done in the School of Medicine is we've uh, requested bargaining on it. And when you do that under law, they're still supposed to suspend it. So if they try to impose something, you request bargaining. We have so much time, then they can't implement it until they meet and bargain. And if they do try to impose it, then it's another violation of law. So one of your other pieces of, with the bullying um, and you wanted us to address was if you have if you have an issue that's with a supervisor versus with another member. And we, we often get those where there's it's making your workplace uncomfortable. Um, we don't grieve against members against members. That doesn't mean you can't come and talk to us because very often if there is an issue, it may be that we need to let Management know that they need to manage, and sometimes that means unpleasant things to make sure that the workplace is appropriately comfortable and um, that everybody can get their job done. Because whether it's whether that issue comes from a member to member or from somebody else, from a supervisor or somebody else in another unit, it's management's responsibility to make sure those things run smoothly as part of their management role. So sometimes it's a matter of having a conversation. If it's with a supervisor, then clearly there's more often situations that we're involved with. And depending on what it is, it may be a conversation, it may be through agreements. Um, but both of those cases should be brought to us, and we can see what we can do to assist. How we assist may differ. Did you have a question? Uh, just a quick question. Still on the subject of grievance. My question has to do with the point of engagement on the part of the union. Mm -hmm. Because the union has a
convene a meeting. We, uh, oftentimes it's uh, individuals or a group of individuals who come to the union office because they often want to meet not in the eye of the boss <coughs> or their director. So they'll come and we'll have a conversation and oftentimes you have to investigate it further. You need some documents and facts. You know, we can't, we can't go on rumors or hearsay, so we need to be able to show that there's something that actually occurred that's in violation um, in order to grieve it anyway. So we generally have those types of meetings. I, we have had meetings where we meet um, when there's been problems, like with the selective salary. We'll, we'll meet with everybody in the department, especially those who are on the selective salary committees, to try to clarify things. And we've all done that kind of stuff. So. But if this is an event, well, let's say, for example, it's a toxic environment. Oh, so there's fear of reprisal. I, right. You right. have that situation. They're not going to come forward under any mm-hmm. circumstances. Mm-hmm. And so I'm asking, is the union at that point, you know full well that there is a grievable offense, or can you then supersede so what, that? And that's why I paused at the first one, because I wanted to hear you. You, 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 you said it again. It goes back to what Rita was saying. The, the idea that we are we are fully aware that there's a toxic environment if we can't get anybody to talk about it, then it's, you know, are there, there are rumors and rumors we heard from the School of Medicine that the law school is having a hard time. At some point, our step would be, are there members of the School of Medicine who are willing to come talk to us? There has to be evidence. If there's yeah. not evidence... It, the, we could write up tons of, of sheets saying this might be happening, this might be or... happening, but there would be no proof that that occurred if people don't come forward. That's the difficult kind of thing. Uh, along um, those same lines, we, we oftentimes, and this goes to what you can do, what's the step point of engagement? We oftentimes will have somebody say, you know what, I've heard this is going to happen, or somebody told me this is going to happen. and. If whatever this is actually happens, it will be something that the union can act upon. But when it's still in that, well, we're thinking about doing this, we're talking in the corners about doing this, we're having a lunchtime conversation about doing this because we happen to have side relationships that cross management um, member lines, but there's no real action. There isn't an email, there isn't a statement in an open meeting that's out going on some minutes somewhere. There needs to be something that we can grab hold of and say, okay, because we have to go someplace. Our first place to go is to the administration and say, you know what, there's something going on because this is not the union's contract, it's not the administration's contract. It's a joint it's contract. contract. And so if we want to go and say there's something that's not going right, we can't just say, you know what, we've heard a, a lot of rumors and they're getting louder and louder and louder that there's something really messed up in school X. I, I would say one other thing is that that we're up here doing you know, grievance stuff. We have contract implementation officers but we have hundreds of members, and if you as a member know someone in that unit, you are empowered to go talk to that person and try to lower their fear and say, you know, I actually talked to two people uh, last semester briefly, one who sort of dragged in her friend <laughs> who, was, who was afraid to talk and, and be seen coming into the union office and so on, and it, it's... We hope we get to the point where, as a union, all of us can talk to someone that we see having a problem like that. Now, if they're so isolated from other places in the university, they don't know anyone, no one really knows them, no one knows something's happening. But if you know something is happening, you know, if you can talk to people there, that's one of the... That's one of the first places that grievances often start, or some kind of action is someone talks and said, you know, I've gone to the union office and no one has written me up, no one has, you know, tried to do something bad to me, etc. That degree of trust among members is probably the best place for that unit to start changing and being different. I think it's an excellent answer. But, um, and so, in the sake of time, we're about halfway through. I'm going to see if maybe we can move, move on, on to the next, next topic. So, um, if we miss somebody, just come back for questions. Yeah. Answers. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The topic is now about factories, bylaws, how they work. And, uh, well, I'll say one thing. There, there are a set of sort of big, broad standards or the factors, and when you're when you're evaluated annually, if you are, 
if you're coming up for ESS or tenure and promotion, those big principles of how, what you're supposed to be doing are supposed to be used to evaluate you. And some of units, you know, you're supposed to get those at least 12 months ahead of time before you're evaluated. You're having more fun. Yeah, yeah. Than we are. Uh, it's HR. <laughs> you killed another employee. Yeah, sorry. Um, at any rate, some people don't know about those factors. They've never been told, or they've been. I know of a case where people was were sent factors from some other unit than theirs by their administrator. Um, or, and that's one of those processes in promotion and tenure that wasn't handled appropriately. Or a new chair comes in in the middle of the year, and they're clueless about those factors. They don't know the contract and the procedures well. Uh, one of the things that happens is those things and the bylaws get worked on by people in the unit, and it's often something like, ooh, I don't want to volunteer to work on that. You know, that's, that's going to take me away from my job. Uh, I'm not going to be able to, to do what I need to be doing if I'm sitting in some committee meeting rewriting something. Um, but those are really important. And if you are on a committee that works on factors or works on bylaws, that tells the administrators that you're a serious person, that you're watching how you're going to be evaluated, that you're, you're, you're taking care, you, you want things to be done correctly in your particular area. How many people have department factors or know, know they have department factors? I take it that others do not have department or, or know that they have department factors. Okay. Um, yeah, a lot of departments I'm finding it's real hit or miss. And I think factors are really critical because it stops arbitrary treatment when you're being evaluated. Because the rules change, and you know, you'll get a new, whether it's a new administrator or just somebody who doesn't like you and wants to treat you, give you, like, oh, you should have had two publications, or right, you should have right. gone to three, you know, presented at three conferences, or whatever it is. They're just kind of winging it. And uh, if there's written standards given to you 12 months ahead of time that the faculty or the academic staff have had input, what, that that's a fair reflection, that's a way to stop arbitrary or unfair treatment by administrators, so it's really critical to have them, which is, in, in, it's a reason why um, sometimes you don't know about them, because maybe it's just the administrator doesn't know about the contract, because they're generally not trained very well on what the contract says. Uh, and maybe it's because they want to have their own sets of rules and how they feel at any given moment what, that, what those rules should be. So. I think it's really critical to make sure to see if you have factors. If you don't have factors, you can come to the union. We have templates that you can use. We can help you organize a committee um, to make sure you have those. Same thing with bylaws. They like they give the rules of how the, it's run. If you don't have the bylaws, then it's all up to your director or your administrator or your chair. So bylaws is a way for the for you to have a voice on how things should be run in your department. And without them, it. It goes, to the, it, pretty much, you know, it goes to the administrator. It gives them more latitude to do those kinds of things. So it's a, it's a nice way to enforce your company. Exactly. We've talked about this a lot on the academic staff side at different workshops, so I'm not going to add much more to that other than to say, are there questions for factors and bylaws from anybody at this time? Okay. And, and I actually referenced them in my handout, I think. Wow. On this handout, which says shared governance contract language, on the third page, there's um, a section on factors. There's also on bylaws. And it references the contract language in the, the contract about how they're supposed to be developed and, the, the, and how it's supposed to be a committee of, of your peers that work on this, that, that make the draft, that have a, have, a, have a right to have a voice in how this stuff is developed. So if you want to look at the specifics, the contract language is there. Um, with regard to the handout, too, there's a note on the back of this. But please, um, anytime we're looking at handouts, whether we yeah. have passed them out, the administration passed them out, that reference the contract, very often they'll have the contract article and where, it, where it's referencing and language that looks and starts off reading just like the contract. But this is not the contract. Right. Right. And we have a small disclaimer on here. And just want to point that out to everybody that as you're reading these, this is a guide that gets you thinking about an area. Have the 
have right. the conversation right. with us before you try to take any action or think that um, you should be taking action in a certain area right. because these are condensed yeah. because this is a lot and as Rita said right. it's written all written in English but so is the Constitution <laughs> right. yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I would say so. especially this one that goes through sort of the front back the grievance the process the beginning before a grievance filed and so on this is definitely not contract language because the contract goes over this is covering several yeah. articles in the contract and so on and this is for just realistically how it looks but especially these things before a grievance filed all of those things don't have to take place you know it just tells you this is sort of usually how it comes to the point of getting to a grievance um, that these are the kinds of things that are typical. Um, so I wanted to just kind of point to some of the things on this um, committee because when I, I started at Wayne State 20 years ago, and I didn't, uh, you know, I went to grad school and all that kind of stuff, but I really wasn't. Um, academia is a totally different place from <laughs> the rest of the world, and I, you know, I represented uh, I was a union rep, union organizer in, uh, in other industries. And so when I came here, it was like, what? <laughs> you know, it's like, so, um, and so there was certain things that I just think are really radical in our contract, and nobody even knows about them. And there are things that, um, that really give you a voice, but if you don't use them, um, you know, you, I guess you lose them. So one of the ones that I was very excited to learn about was um, the, this budget advisory committee which gives you the right to form committees. Now, I, now, there's some limits on who can be in that those committees and who can't. I think it's just for academic. So uh, so if you're in a division like Barbara Jones, I don't believe you have a budget committee, right, Barbara? Right. Okay. So you have to be in an academic uh, school to, or department to have these. But you have um, a group that get to look at the books, that get access to financial information to give a say and um, a voice on this. And so... That was something I thought, well, that's that's pretty cool. And um, But a lot of people don't even know that they have the right to do this. So I'm pointing you in that direction to check it out, especially because of, we're in the financial situation that we're in. Um, I know the School of Medicine, we had some issues with um, with this because they have this crazy deal where they have our Wayne State University here, and then they have this private organization called University Physicians Group, which is... Um, they consider themselves private. They don't want to share their information. But we challenged that in, um, in, in the Michigan Employment Relations Commission. And they um, we got the administration to agree that they should be budget committees and advisory committees even for, for that section. So that's um, something you should check out. Um, the, the third one down is the one that sort of really floored me. And you may know it already, but that's where you get to review a chair or a dean um, in the department. And well, so in that there's actually faculty or academic staff members on these committees. Now, you have to be in a, uh, a department that has at least five people with ESS or, and or tenure in order to form these committees. But if you ha meet that threshold, then um, these folks are subject to review with faculty and academic staff input. So if you have somebody who is harassing you or is unfair or is not doing a good job as your academic leader, um, there is an opportunity. And it happens the final, the, the, the year before their contract is up. Mm -hmm. So you find out when their contract is up, how long they're in, when it's going to be renewed. And then if you have, then you can um, start pushing to get a review. I know we did step in pharmacy where there, um, there were some issues and we had to really push and the uh, provost office helped us to make sure that that happened where they had to do a review. They do surveys, get people's input. So you might have been involved in that. But the thought of, and it's sort of a check on sometimes if an administrator knows that you know and that you know how the review process works. So, And sometimes it has an effect and sometimes, depending on who the provost is, if they really like the person, it doesn't matter what people say. Um, they'll keep it anyway. But, anyway. <laughs> but it's still, it's, it's, it's a, good, uh, a, a good process. Um, so then, of course, there's um, in the hiring. So when you hire, a uh, contract also says before they hire someone, um, 
uh, in, in a, uh, a position, a bargaining in a position, they're supposed to consult with the, um, a, a committee of, in your department. They're supposed to also, in the, there's also language in the wage um, uh, article 12, that they're supposed to disclose and have discussion about the salary. So we've had, uh, we had a problem with academic staff where they were hiring out of the dean's office a bunch of advisors. They just sort of, I don't know, did whatever they wanted and didn't, didn't consult with these committees. And it created a real problem because uh, they weren't part of the process and it, it made people feel like they were disregarded. And so, right, so they're supposed to have these committees, so if, they're, if you're doing hiring, um, you should be, um, there should either be a committee or they should consult the folks with tenure or ESS. Now, there's some, been some discussion about possible layoffs in some areas. Um, there, I don't know. I don't think it's going to happen. It's rumor at this point. I can't confirm anything, but you know, we all know that the School of Medicine is having some really serious financial difficulties, where they're bleeding about 20 million a year. Some, some people estimate a lot more. And so, <clears throat> there's. If we ever um, come into the process, uh, the, the point where we need to talk layoff, there's supposed to be these advisory committees before and that come up with a plan to look for alternatives to that, to save money. I mean, we have, and one of the reasons why we have um, all of this uh, shared governance is because we have people who work here who are experts, who are really smart, who are, who are you know, they, 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 it's to tap into the knowledge that we have here to have them on the committees. Now, sometimes people don't want to hear what you have to say or won't acknowledge that, but those people aren't very smart. So, um, so, the last one is uh, Article 24. We've had a lot of discussions about that. And um, uh, there's also uh, some opportunities for, you know, evaluating for, we don't call it merit pay, we call it selective salary because we think oftentimes the people who are most meritorious aren't selected for an increase. So, um, not always, but it's unusual. Um, so, that's the overview there. I have given some definition of some terms. I'm, sure, you know, I'm guessing you all know of them. Um, and by the way, the, there's actually um, contract language that says you have the right to be given time to participate in these mm -hmm. sorts of activities as well, that that should be part of your job. Right. I know, for example, that going back to the factors, that one of the factors for academic staff is sort of professional growth and activity. And this was several years ago. Um, so I don't know what the union ever did about it, but someone, in fact, was was asked to present at a conference for people who do academic staff advising. I think there's a couple of professional organizations. And the chair said, no, we won't give you travel money to go to this conference and make this presentation. And then at the evaluation time, it was like, well, you haven't engaged in any professional <laughs> activities. <laughs> it was like, um, this is not right, uh, obviously, uh, because they were the chair was really preventing the person from doing the things right. that they right. needed to do in that case. Set up. Yeah, it was a setup. Uh, that's the kind of thing the union could definitely uh, have sunk, we could have sunk our teeth into that. I don't yeah, think it we happened. Had, we've had situations like that. We <laughs> yeah. can't force the administration to give the money, although there are sources right. of money that, especially on the academic staff side and the faculty side, for professional development activities that come from a variety of sources, including the provost office. Mm -hmm. But on the point of the peer review selection, selective salary is a peer review process, and part of the benefit of that is if you're at that those college or division level committees and somebody is not presenting as much in terms of their professional development and achievement and they've got in their narrative, yeah, requested and was not allowed to participate. That's where the peer review process helps smooth that out. And at this point, unless there's something else, we should probably open up for yep, questions. Yep, any, um, any, any questions? questions? And it doesn't have to be on these topics. Yeah. Anything, anything that, that we have to talk about. Here in the Yeah, second year. Like nitpicky questions. Uh, the chair, director, dean, would that also include associate deans? No. Oh. Unfortunately. And then for budget, that would be actual budget, not the prospective budget published in the budget book that we already have. Well, the budget book comes from the Board of Governors and is broken down. Right. It's kind of a high level, even sometimes it drives mm -hmm. down, but that's for within your college. Mm -hmm. so we right. have the right to the actual spent money, not just Well, the there's, there's some language in the contract, and 
forgive me for not being able to quote it exactly, but it, it speaks to that you should have access to the information that you need. Okay. And also under the Freedom of Information Act, because you're a public entity, yeah. you know, you have the right to get all sorts of data. Now, there are universities, you can, you can go to the library at Michigan or Michigan State and get the entire thing down to how much money Department X is spending on copy it. paper. I you can't do that at Wayne State. Exactly. Um, I don't know why. The actual language for the Budget Advisory oh, Committee you. is Article 31, and I won't read it all here, but see, as somebody who served on the law school's Budget Advisory Committee and uh, with the academic center, what, you'll often, what we often hear is that, based on the way the language reads and how it's enforced, the advisory committees are one or advisory, and so that that's mm -hmm. less than consultative. Um, but there's a back and forth in different places, a tension between how much, what's the information is, is necessary to advise, and how does that come down in the nuts and bolts of do we get quarterly reports, and what detail are in those quarterly reports. So most places where there's a conversation, it, that's typical to, to, to go back and forth. In some places it's a little better because of the relationship, but contractually it takes us so far, but it doesn't say, okay, we want to see every nickel and dime of the data spending, and we want to see it from all places. That would be wonderful, but this is a negotiated document, and it gives us part of the way. Part of the way. Yeah. That's fair. Um, you had a question? Yeah, I, I, oh, yeah, he had a follow-up on the project. Exactly. So I'm, I'm trying to think, do they have the right to deny us access to the budget? Well, my... To money spent. My, my, my issue is, is um, with this, I don't, I don't think they out and out deny. They sort of, eat, when I've asked for budget information, they send me over like a, a like this, and I ask for very specific kinds of things. It's like a real song and dance. So they never will say, no, we're refusing to give you information. They'll say, oh, here's this, we thought you meant this, and it's like, and it's not, might not be formatted the way you want it, and the, laid out the way you want it. Um, they'll say the information's in there somewhere. Just go figure it out. So it, it's, um, that's been my experience anyway. They, they, it's, it's really hard to grasp. Well, they say that document doesn't exist. In, um, if you FOIA it, they can charge you all this money to say they're going to make it. I'd say, I'll say in class especially, because I see a little bit of this, most of that withholding of information is at the dean's level, not in the department specifically. All right, so I was told, I was, if I can, um, that they will not show us the budget because they don't want, they don't want us to see what they spend on individuals. Now, that's, that's, that's public information. information. That's public information, well, yeah. Yeah, I would, I would ask you when you say that and they, you got information from, um, is it, am I correct? In, the chair. From the, from the chair. chair. And, and do you, are you familiar with who's in your budget advisory committee? Me. Okay. <laughs> so, you're having, so you're having the conversation. You're having the, yeah. So that would be a thing. Come and, and talk to us. Right. It's the same kind of tension that we would have yeah. going back and forth with deans or chairs. And it's it's right. a continual conversation. And we can say, yes, they don't have the right, what it will actually put in your hands and the specific questions you're trying to get to. Come and we can try to give us some strategies and, and we'll work on that. I mean, ultimately, we could make a request under the under labor law, uh, the Public Employee Relations Act. The union has the right to information to monitor the contract, or um, mm -hmm. and and if they and they don't provide it, we can file an unfair labor practice. So now, and I I find dealing with some of the folks that are that do overdo oversee the budget. They're, they're less, like, as Rita kind of referred to, um, they're less Not transparent than others, and it, it is a real battle. And maybe if we yeah. all put our heads together, we can figure out a way to, to, to crack it and figure out a way to, to get that information. Yeah. Yes, so, so as faculty, full-time, um, 18 years in, a couple years ago when my chair suggested that my line was not going to be renewed, that I should get my act together and I won't be rehired uh, because I don't have the academic standings, but I have the work standings as my credentials. Um, I came, spoke with you, Michelle, about it, and then last year I spoke with uh, Mr. about it uh, because it was
was continuing, now that my chair then is in the provost's office, um, my dean suggested, well, it's going to be up to your chair. You know, all I asked was for an advance in title from lecturer to senior lecturer. And it was basically stated that what they waived for my academic requirements for the lecturer didn't equate to the senior lecturer, even though the p and committee passed me to get that. And, uh, and the chair passed it forward, and then John Van who was my chair, who suggested me to leave, turned it down. Is that a grievance, or what is that? Well... Because I'm going to retire anyhow. I'm just going yeah, to leave. Yeah. As far I mean, as I'm concerned, I did get my ducks in a row, and I, mm -hmm. right. I'm secure enough where I don't have to be here. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, they're doing a national search to sort of replace me, but not. Mm -hmm. It's not fair to the students right. uh, that are in flux. Right. Um, on those kinds of, did you want, am I talking too much? No. no, 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 no. On, on those, all right, so when it comes to uh, promotion, tenure, it, it's a peer review process. And uh, because it's a peer review, uh, and, and also because the contract recognizes that, we can only grieve if there's a, what we call a procedural defect, or if there was not fair consideration. Um, and that's where somebody manipulates this, the, the process, or um, they don't follow the process, like they appointed everybody on the department committee and they were all friends of the chair who didn't like you or something like that. So if there's a procedural defect, we can grieve the process, but the outcome of the process we cannot grieve <coughs> because by, by contract, by law, we can only grieve the other party to the contract, which is the administration. And if they interfered with the process to make it tainted. And, no, and, and a lot of times these evaluations are very, sub they are subjective. And we try to keep the criteria and the factors, but when really when you get into a group of room, a room with a group of people making an evaluation on somebody, it's their expert subjective opinion, and sometimes that is not the always. The thing is, you should have gotten you should have gotten a letter from Vanderweg about why he said no, even though the lower levels had said yes for you. I would also advise you to ask to see your personnel file and look through it and see if there was something in there that, you know, was persuasive. That For selective salary, I wasn't even included in that because my contract was going to expire. The dean had all my materials. And then when he was finished with them, the nine-month people in the committee were gone, and they didn't, wouldn't reconvene. And likewise, I, I didn't get any adjustments. So you didn't get any, you didn't get any adjustments? Like no. Last and see, year. that's, you're so, supposed to have that, you know, that consideration. If right. It wasn't even done for him. Right, because they thought his contract. But if my right. contract, I signed last fall, it was for two years, mm -hmm. right? And uh, I just want to end it early. You can. I have other things I can do. Yeah. At this point, I would say stick around and talk to us because of the, I think we're starting to move into it. It's, it's a it's more, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Are there other questions I saw handed? Sylvia, you, you Well, someone wasn't asked the question. Yeah, at least I'll oh. uh, How do you find out when your chair, dean, director's contract expires? Well, one thing you're if you have a unit financial administrator, they're supposed to know this information. Mine did, at least, when I asked the question a couple of years ago. Uh, I don't know that that's generally true, but he knew he was right. Uh, Is there another place that information is available? Yeah. I mean, the union can make a request yeah. Um, yeah. to just get that information um, to see to, about it under PARA. And um, yeah. I've gotten that. And uh, I don't always get the answers as quickly back as quickly as I want. And sometimes it takes, it drags on and on. But I, I have gotten answers, especially if I ask for, like, uh, you know, everybody in this college or something, all the cheers. Mm -hmm. So if I narrow it down, yeah, I can get that. Yeah. But I don't think, I think they actually have to go out and figure it out. I don't think they store the information in the provost office. Um, there is an office that deals specifically with review, however, of chairs and departments, and I'm sure that office has it, and that's somewhere, but I don't know where in, in the provost unit. But we can have um, 
So if there's an individual you want us to check out, let us know. I usually put them all into a group so they don't, so it's not yeah, obvious. Single out. <laughs> right, 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 right. You're protected from that, yeah. Sylvia, so, yeah, University. Oh, yeah, Lisa did too. No, no, okay. Uh, well, this goes back to the, uh, the factors of discussion. Yes. So both the my department factors and the college and university factors in terms of tenure promotion mentioned, you know, you have to do your research, go and you uh, uh, right. present to conferences. But our dean very quietly got rid of all of the travel money uh, that would enable us to do conferences. And our department hasn't had a travel budget since I've been here. It's been 10 years. Mm -hmm. So in terms of, you know, going up for tenure promotion, how do, I mean, I'm assuming, like you mentioned in the example, just say in the annual reviews, I was more than happy to go present, but you took our money away, so let's do it. <laughs> Is that a legitimate way to do yeah. that? Partly, but there's also the, there's money in the country for faculty and for academic staff that's outside of your department. And so that would be part of the story. But it's a but really you, you small pool. It's a small it's pool. A very small but yeah, so it's, 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 it's yeah. yeah, but for just don't want to leave you with, yeah, that's all you have to do is put that line in your, uh, your office. I, I actually know much. someone in former years who wrote a letter to the provost and did get their travel funded. Uh, it was sort of like, I'm supposed to do something, and I am told I can't do it. And further advice that I really don't need to be away from my work for that many days anyway. It's like, yeah, and this is for the whole college. Is for all uh, yes, class. Yes, he put it in. He actually, people may have missed it. It was an email that had absolutely nothing to do. It was about town halls for the college's, um, uh, I forgot the word, uh, our, our plan, our, our strategic plan. Mm -hmm. and literally, the very end, it's a PS. By the way, you know, the annual money we were getting to do for new computers and travel, that money's gone. Gone. You should ask your chair about this because in my department, what he said was, not everybody used their money last year, and we've been told we can use last year's money for well, we this year's ours, travel. So that was like, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Utilized to really start priming that pump now. 
we actually yeah. hired somebody. Right. Yeah, Mark. And we should have been introducing you as often as we can. Right, right. Yes, we did. So, and if you want to help with that endeavor, just let us know. We're, we're doing one on one conversations, talking to people, finding the people who aren't full members, and asking them to. We have, we have um, like three quarters of our, of our members are full members. That's one of his primary responsibilities yeah. right now. He's been working one on one. Yeah, well, he can use some help, so, so let us know if you want to help. I have a question on maybe a different note, kind of thing, more about an ounce of prevention, kind of a question. You know, I'm in pharmacy and health sciences. We have a brand new dean. Yes. Uh, she's outstanding in so many ways. I've had a great conversation with her. I think it's phenomenal. She's, this is her first deanship. I don't know if she worked in, in a, a, a union university mm -hmm. before. What, what advice would you give so that she doesn't get herself into grievance issues a lot. I mean, I don't think she wants to be part of the grievances. Read. Go in with a contract. Yeah. And say, yeah. Well, you know, maybe you and Jesse and the other council reps yeah. can go and just at, have coffee with her and just right. talk to her and say, we're here to support you. We want to make sure you don't violate the contract. <laughs> you know, I will um, say <laughs> last year they actually held a a orientation for, for new administrators and actually I went and talked and this is one of the things I yeah. you know said the best advice I can give you is to read the contract because you will need it if you don't understand it we'll tell you <laughs> what you know help you with stuff but that's it basically if they haven't worked in a unionized environment they probably will make some mistakes right. but I think uh, it's good for you it's an opportunity for you to have a good relationship right. you don't want to be the first meeting to be when something goes wrong and it's yeah. better to do it on a, you know, sort of a neutral, positive mm -hmm. note, I think. Any yeah. other? You know, that was my question. I was going to ask, is there any time that the union like, works with managerial staff at all the any time. point to help them understand how to We get calls we, at the we, office. We get calls at the office. Cheers. But on the <laughs> other hand, the administration won't let us, you know, set up forums for administrators particularly. Um, but I was really pleased that we were included in that, but I don't think we've had one this year where we've been included. Um, so it's hard, hard to say. You know, changes that it, we're going to be getting a new provost one of these days, that's going to affect a whole lot of yeah. how things are done. And I hope we get a provost who's a good, good person. And can academic staff come in and set up how to read the contract to explain to our... <laughs>
three of the four people in the office were at conferences that particular day. And this person said, oh, I thought there were a couple of dozen people sitting around the union office drinking coffee and just not answering the phone. (laughs) And so I've said, you know, I'm not paid to do this. I do get a course release, but I'm not paid any, no cash for being here during the academic year. And I'm saying I think that that people don't understand that, that I don't know how many grievances we actually filed last year, but we fielded dozens and dozens and dozens, well over 100 questions. Right. I know right people. now we have a list of, it's a, it's a, it's a chart, and I believe it's 16 pages 16. long of yeah. current issues we're dealing with right yeah. now. Um, that doesn't include the academic staff, which is another three pages right. of right. issues. And some of those are filed grievances, some of those that are in process yeah. that we're trying to do something about it without it having to go to a, the grievance procedures. Um, but it is very, very time consuming. And, uh, it's and three or four. So. In part, that's because the problems that you guys have are important, and we have to take the time to listen and to understand you and understand what your work is and what the difficulty right. is. If we don't take that time, we can't fairly. Right, and also, it also means that we need council yeah. reps. So if you don't have a council rep yeah. in your area who can help us resolve these issues, then uh, consider doing it or finding some, helping us find someone. Thank you very Thank much, you. everyone. Thank you. I'll stick around. We're here for questions if you need them.